Hi there again. Um, can everybody see and hear me? Yeah, fantastic. Okay, so welcome to the final panel, which is called Common Futures. Um, so I'm chairing this and um, we've unfortunately only got three of the four people that were on this um, panel because um, Naomi's been called off for an emergency. Um, so I'll just introduce the panel and if you'd like to turn your cameras on, that would be fantastic. Um, so firstly, we've got um, Alina Azadeh, who is an artist and performer and writer and social activist who's been making work for and with galleries, museums and across diverse communities for over 20 years. Um, secondly, we've got Taranj Kansari, who you've just met, um, and she's joining us for this panel. Um, and thirdly, um, I'd like to welcome Deirdre Figueredo, who's the director of Craft Space. Craft Space is the main non-academic partner for the research network Crafting the Commons that um, is the reason we're all here today. Um, and also Deirdre curated the um, We Are Commoners touring exhibition. Um, and you can have a look at the virtual tour after this um, event. Um, so welcome everybody. Um, what I'm gonna do um, as a way of kind of tying this together is I'm going to just kind of Oops. Um, to respond in turn um, and maybe that could turn into a little bit of a dialogue. Um, so just things to think about really. Um, and to Ranj, I think I think you started this off very well in, in thinking about what, what did we do with all this talk? Um, uh what is the role of creativity and craft practice in bringing about change and making this move away from uh, a very kind of individualized subjectivity and bearing in mind that so many ways of working is about rewarding the individual. Um, another question that's related to that as well is the question of how we can decolonize the commons. So I'm thinking quite specifically here about um, about the role that histories play, and Peter outlined this very, very well in um, telling stories through which one can reimagine or imagine a future. Um, and so how do we address the past in relation to the futures that we craft in a way that allows marginalized voices to speak? Um, so they're the two kind of intersecting questions really about about what do we do and how we um, open up the relationship between the past and the future. Um, so I'll just um, go to each of you um, in turn and Taranda I'm going to start with you because you're probably the most warmed up here if that's okay. <laughs> no problem. Um, so which one do you want me to start with? I don't mind. You don't have to answer it all. <laughs> um, I mean, I think in terms of the impact, um, I do think it's through practice. Um, so again, um, I know I keep referring to John Holloway, but I, I, I think in his, he, in his book, Take, uh, Changing the World Without Taking Power, um, I, I really love it because he basically says, if you're operating with, the idea of revolution or taking big power or, or, or overthrowing big power, then you're always operating or you're starting your starting point with that top down power. And so practice, which is from the ground up, can actually um, be the opposite to that, where you start to shift through doing, uh, shift culture and shift socialization of or re-socialize actually people that come in contact with that form of practice, um, a different way of doing things or a different value system or a, a and I think part of why I, I, I've seen that impact in 20 years of teaching um, where I've seen my students go, not, not in the commons, unfortunately 20 years, but, uh, but socially engaged architecture going out, doing things differently. And that has completely shifted the conversation within architecture around social 
values, which it wasn't around as much 25 years ago, you know, it was all formalism and so on. And I think that slow shift, if we can multiply that and have lots of different forms of commons practice where we actually, what Peter was talking about as well, deliberative platforms, it might not be through the production, but, but whatever form it takes, where you deliberate, you dialogue, you, you, you challenge and reimagine um, neoliberal values. Um, I think that is the best way to, it might take time, but I think it will take time anyway, but at least that's, I like the slowness of it. Um, <laughs> I think, I think snow is good. <laughs> Thank you so much, Taranj. Um, Lena, I wonder whether you might like to respond to Taranj's provocations or to, to my initial questions? Mm. Yeah, I would say as well as this idea of you can't address that <clears throat> if you if you go too big, you're always going to be kind of fighting the, <laughs> the dragon. You have to go right down uh, to that level. I would say also it's about working from the inside out and creating the kind of mental and emotional spaces um, within uh, collective imaginations to think about how what visioning what a different kind of future looks like and uh, because we're, we're so sort of um, beset by um, <clears throat> you know the harms of you know, capitalism and also we're so uh, in response to the harm that we've caused uh, the planet and we're, we're kind of in this constant um, you know struggle so for me it's about how do you create spaces actually away from that where and that's what I kind of like to do with my work where people can kind of um, be given actually a free space in which to kind of imagine things together. So um, I think um, a lot of this idea of nurturing, um, you know, the emotional com commons and through the day, people have talked about care and, um, and then there's a sense of solidarity um, and that can be political, but it can also be emotional and how people, you know, delic delicately unravel and have their, their histories and um, stories um, given um, of uh, uh, heard uh, and uh, platformed and, and, and brought centre stage, you know, so we talk about working with marginalised communities and, uh, and, you know, diversifying uh, participation on all these kind of phrases that we use in order, when we work with people, but how do we, um, you know, create space where people feel that they are, that, that their own histories and their heritages and their knowledge and their skills are, you know, um, of central uh, importance. Um, and um, there's a really brilliant, I mean, I, uh, uh, one of the things I do is write and I'm really into speculative fiction at the moment. And one of my heroines is Octavia Butler. And the quote I love from her is that there's nothing new under the sun, but there are new suns, you know? So how do you create the kind of spaces where people can imagine what those new suns look like, feel like, and what would it be like to live under, you know, uh, under them. So for me, it's really an inside out process as well um, in collaboration with, with people. And um, because I struggle with the kind of hierarchical idea of trying to affect change in that kind of, you know, individual collective getting with power structures. And it's just about creating other kinds of realities and imagine, and imagine them. And, and materials are really important for that because they, 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 they liberate your thinking and they, and they help you to feel through and use other parts of your being to, to do that. So um, yeah, making together, um, it liberates a different, it, it, it creates a different kind of storytelling and sharing and imagining and dreaming together I have found. Um, that's kind of outside of the constraints of, um, you know, uh, uh, the, the organized and the, the enclosed. And um, so I don't know if that does that respond to your question. <laughs> I wonder if you could give an example of a space where that might happen, just to just yeah. to get some specifics here. Yeah, well, so if I think about, I mean, I mean, I guess we could refer to our project, um, Deirdre, or, or also if I think about um, um, this idea of uh, using um, materials. So we, we did a uh, we did a series for the project. We did a series of workshops that uh, developed um, that that were developed. Um, for those who were in lockdown. So, um, and um, we asked people to find materials in their homes and we looked at different themes. So I thought about the, the um, 
uh, some of the things that might be coming up through the through the um, through the lockdown. So fear and uh, do people feel, feel safe? And we're trying to find um, ways of working through uh, uh, emotions and um, creating solidarity between people. And so one of the things that we did that was the sort of the most um, let's say uh, popular was was making uh, medals of courage so people were asked to think about people that they knew who were uh, living or dead or having a difficult time or, or think of themselves and to think of, and to and to make a piece of uh, you know a medal and to uh, write inside that uh, inside the medal a kind of a message to self or to the other person and gift that it was kind of a gift making um, and uh, so we did this quiet making, as, as I, you saw with some of the videos, that's quiet making, it was over Zoom. But what struck me, um, people would weave in all kinds of things. So from their children's teeth to bits of uh, material they, they found that they'd had for years that had particular stories attached to them. And what you found was that um, when it came to the kind of the optional sharing, that something kind of happened in the space. Um, and which was that the other people that they were making this work for were were present, uh, and um, there was a kind of a, I think there was a kind of a, 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 a relief in sharing um, some of those stories. I mean, they're all they're all um, they're all confidential stories, so I can't really give specific examples. But um, there was a sense of solidarity between people that they had gone through something really major in the last you know several months through. The you know the constraints of COVID and and the sense of the limitation of their um, uh, connection with others that was through making this tiny little thing and being able to tell stories about it that um, um, gave them access to another way of thinking and also thinking beyond this time about what might come afterwards. Um, so um, that's a very very small example and also in terms of um, heritage and land, I'm doing a project that's about um, decolonizing the heritage of a particular piece of the uh, English countryside. And um, the, idea, the, there, the idea there is that, um, uh, uh, how, do you dis how, do you make, how do you make belonging through um, common practice? So, you know, when you've got very fixed, um, uh, when you've got a very fixed idea that we have at the moment of land being linked to kind of historical relationship and our sense of belonging linked to a historical relation to that land, how do you disrupt that uh, and give people who have who may um, you know may not have been born here or be familiar with that land or have lived on that land uh, different access to claiming belonging um, and with me it's through storytelling and writing and making as well. Um, and, and that's done through quite delicate, again, delicate spaces that are cultivated uh, with particular groups of people. And then through, through that, that's then shared more broadly, but, but initially it's a very delicate cultivation of kind of a process of, of, uh, of being on the land and writing on the land and writing with the non-human as well. I think Giuseppe was, was beautiful what he was talking about earlier, which was the, don't, was it the non-DIY don't, don't yeah, do, do, I, do it yeah. without yourself. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So I think that's a really important aspect of that as well. Okay. I'm going to move on and, and bring Deirdre in now, um, because Deirdre, I know, you know, um, one of the reasons that why this project came about was was to do with with your sense that you, you wanted to, to, to try and think about how a, a, a response could be generated to what you were seeing around you and an, an increasing sense of privatization, particularly of public space and of, of common amenities. Um, so I wondered what your thoughts were really in, in thinking about the way in which as, as, as makers and, and, and craftspeople and designers, we can enact the world differently and move away from that individualist subjectivity. Yeah, thanks, Leila. Um, I think what we've seen through um, all of the projects really that are have come out through the exhibition is um, the way that if you use craft, you know, as a lens um, and as a tool to common and to, to think about ideas of commoning, um, it's a fantastic way of um, bringing um, excluded histories into being and, and writing in excluded histories in a way that, that you least expect. Um, 
so there, there are some great examples. Um, I think Alina's project, Craft in Common, um, we, we didn't really imagine how it would be used. I mean, it was, you know, it was created, it was brought into being, and it's only now that people are commoning with it that we discover how they are using craft and, and making as a lens to recover stories and tell stories and, and connect it with pasts that actually haven't, you talk about, you know, decol how do we decolonize? Well, much of what is, is surfacing through um, making the courage medals, for example, and these other things um, hasn't yet been researched or, or recovered and people are, are doing that for themselves. So, for example, we were able to use, um, once the resource was there, we used it for Black History Month and it, it, we commissioned um, young um, early career black artists to uh, nominate an, uh, somebody, a black person of their choice and make um, a courage medal to commemorate them or, or to, to commemorate their courage really. And the stories that they wrote alongside those medals were just little small acts and small moments of, of recovering history and heritage in a very personal way uh, and decolonizing at the same moment in a fascinating way. So for example, um, I invited a drag queen called Ishi Black, um, one of Birmingham's few dra drag queens to, to make a, a, a courage medal. And um, she chose her grandparents in Birmingham who we discovered through that little story were actually pioneers of care provision in Birmingham. So they were, they were these fantastic African Caribbean um, couple who set up a, a care home and against a lot of, faced a lot of discrimination and racism, but persisted and you know, pursued their, their dream. Uh, and through their small act, they actually, now looking back on it, uh, uh, there's a fantastic story about care provision and their pioneering spirit, um, you know, in, in that moment. And another artist um, chose the painter, Frank Bowling, you know, who came from Guyana in 1953. That was his inspiration, his role model. And um, there's something fantastic there about sort of recovering that sense of inspiration and holding those people up. Um, so that kind of idea of solidarity community that Taranj talked about, I felt that that Alina's resource uh, craft in common starts to sort of gather, you know, gather that sense of um, of belonging and, and that sense of as well, I think, interse intersectional experience. So I think craft has a really strong role to play in because you can make collectively together. It has a strong role in bringing out um, and representing a common futures, if you like, around intersectional experience. So, for example, you know, if you're deaf, but you're also black and you're also queer, well, what kind of commoning, what does commoning look and feel like for you? Um, and I'm really interested in how we can use making and craft to explore those things. Thanks, and I'm sorry I cut out then and missed a little bit in the middle, but I wanted to bring up this idea of mid reality just as a kind of closing um, thing to think about. When um, to ranch, you, in your talk, you were really closely focusing on the, the role of matter and, and the material objective in the common in May Collective. And we've been talking today about, about commons as being um, an outcome rather than an object so uh, the outcome of process of practices of commoning rather than a thing which pre-exists those practices so so the commons doesn't pre-exist the practices through which it's produced so i was thinking um quite specifically about the role that these objects play in changing changing the way in which we understand ourselves really in re in relation to each other and and how important it is to not overlook the political role of objects i suppose in thinking about commons so uh, uh, taranj i wonder if you could just um finish off with some final comments on that um i mean you know there there isn't a singular answer i mean i think in terms of i think why I quite like materiality is that, especially the way it's been 
framed in anthropology is that it's relational and it's about it's embedded in social relations so actually the object is the mediator of those relationships uh, more than anything it's not a thing in itself that you adore or you know you you kind of put out there so so as that kind of mediator i think it can take lots of different forms from being fictional futures to um you know like i showed the the temporary architecture that occupies space um or um uh, you know, uh, or a gas mask that's made from a bottle, you know, or, or, or any of those kind of objects. Um, for me, they, I think within the Commons, they, they do, especially at this point, wh while we're within a neoliberal context, I think they do have a disobedience, in my opinion. Uh, again, I'm not saying this is, you know, uh, the, the correct opinion. I'm just saying, in my opinion, they do have something politically charged um, uh, in them. Um, and and so, so how everybody frames that or anybody frames that. And I, I and the thing is that I don't think again, I, I don't, I don't like um, black and white situations. So, you know, that the individual bad, collective good, you know, uh, these kinds of things, because I think uh, collective societies can also be very stifling. And patriarchal and and collectivity can be extremely stifling and disempowering so so i think it's really about a negotiated position between so that you don't have hegemon, he, he, hegemony between one or the other and i think it's it's really that's why the deliberative is quite important to to negotiate where the individual is and where the collective is and where the action is and where the good is you know, that, that's why the common good for me is quite a good frame, because um, what is it? Is the common good the community? Is it the objects? Is it the, I don't know. I mean, I think every project can develop their own in a way. Again, I don't want to be deterministic about that. But I think what I like about a framing of materiality is that it's, it's relational. It's human, non-human. Uh, relate social relationships, political relationships, and and it's all of that stuff together that creates the materiality of it. Um, and so maybe uh, I don't want to talk too much because I know you guys have a film to show still. <laughs> we we do. Thank you. Um, and, and we will move on to the final film now. But thank you very much, um, Alina and Deirdre and Taranj, um, for that closing session. Um, the final interlude film we're going to show today is um, a film about the NETS project which was um, co-created by Rosina who we met earlier on this afternoon. Um, so Rosina and her collaborators worked with over 400 people in several com communities along the, um, the Santiago River, it was a very polluted river in Guadalajara in Mexico. Um, so yeah if we can just play that film now. Um, that will lead us into our closing remarks.
Well, thank you. Um, I love watching that film. I find there's something very, um, very powerful about all the people carrying the, the, the created um, net together. Um, very moving. So um, we're just about at the end. We've managed to finish on time, which is always a, <laughs> a great achievement when we have such an amazing um, group of people together uh, sharing sharing ideas. So uh, Deirdre, are you, are you here? You are, sorry, you're on a different screen of my Zoom. I'm, I'm obviously <laughs> not quite in control by this point in proceedings. Um, so yeah, we're just going to round up. I've got some um, final uh, thank yous and uh, I suppose the final bit of housekeeping. Um, so I'd like to say thank you to our keynote, Peter Langbaugh, uh, to our invited presenter, Taranj Kansari, um, such uh, rich ideas that they shared. Um, thank you to all of the panellists and the chairs, and to Deirdre and Leila, who have been instrumental in planning and delivering the event. Um, thanks also to the network members who haven't been able to join us this afternoon. You know, we, we had a great group of people. We've got the same number again of, of amazing people that we, you know, could have fed into those conversations. So thank you to them um, because their, their thinking and sharing has fed into the ideas that we have been able to explore together today. Um, I want to say thank you to the Craftspace team behind the scenes and particularly to Emma Dacre 
um, who achieved the feat along with Deirdre of, of creating an exhibition about solidarity and togetherness in the midst of a global pandemic, which has kept us all at home and, and separated. Um, and you know, that's been the focus for the network. So quite an incredible amount of work and uh, quality of work. So thank you for that. Um, I'll say thank you to Gareth, our Zoom technician, who's guided us through the process of, of being here today. Um, thank you for, for all the attendees for joining us and uh, you know, listening to the, to the conversations. Um, we'll try to capture the chat. Someone did ask a question about that. We'll, we'll try to capture the chat and make it available. But please do uh, use the Padlet. We'll put the link in the chat once again. Uh, but please do use the Padlet to share your thoughts, ideas, comments, questions, tensions. Perhaps you know we'll we'll leave it open so uh, it's it's not closing now that, that this symposium is finishing. Um, I feel like there's been so many great ideas uh, coming my way. I'll I'll need some time to to digest them and respond. So, you know, please do feel free to kind of uh, respond and contribute um, when you're ready over the next hours or days. Um, and this isn't the end. This is only the start of the first section of, of today's um, event. Um, we're taking a break, but please do join us again for the virtual guided tour of the exhibition that we've, we've referred to so many times and we've given you insights into some of the work. Um, but, you know, there's, there's a a lot there that we haven't we haven't been able to get to um, and so the guided tour will, will take you through the full exhibition. I think that's all of my thank yous and housekeeping. Uh, Leila and Deirdre, I wonder if you have a, a closing thought or comment that you'd like to share. Um, Leila, shall I go to you first? Yeah, I think it's impossible to wrap up actually and, and kind of summarise everything in a little succinct set of words um but no it's been a, it's been a wonderful day and i think you know we've moved from some really seminal historical work through some amazing creative practice combined with more kind of theory stuff on on commons through to thinking about design and futures and and yeah there's too much ground to even even talk about and i think it's going to take a while to to settle um but thanks everybody so much for participating and for really really giving some solid food food for thought deirdre yeah no um thank you to Leila and amy for their uh, fantastic co-organizing and um some really solid um, thinking and, and fleet of foot thinking as well. Um, am I still on screen? You are, yeah. Yeah. Um, I think some of the thoughts um, that have impressed me just sort of uh, in the, you know, in the, it, along the presentations, I, I really liked uh, the thought that Dimitri put into our heads around the idea of, you know, putting stuff out there, put it, putting actions and thoughts out there um, for people to participate without intentionality or necessarily planned sharing. So I, I really like that idea because that is, can be surprising. It can make people think differently. Um, and, you know, it's quite opportunistic, which I think, you know, so, something about commoning and futures that maybe we, you know, maybe we, we can get to somewhere in unexpected ways if, if it's not too planned. Uh, and things happen that you least expect. So I really like that idea. Um, and then maybe enclosures becoming more open that way. Uh, and I love uh, the idea also from that idea from Tarange about or the expression of the disability and object. And I was started imagining sort of um, ways of, um, uh, of, of, of posing questions around, you know, um, decolonizing sort of questions um, through disobedient sort of objects in a way and, and maybe doing you know a combination of what Dimitri says and they're putting those disobedient objects out there to be um to be engaged with that's the thing that's uh, and to be you know people to do things together um and and eventually to come together in some kind of a shared understanding of all our pasts um is, is something that we can do through craft and commoning so I think you know that would be fantastic um so just a, a quick Another housekeeping thing is, is that people can use their same link uh, to get into the um, virtual tour tonight. And um, we look forward to, to you know, do join us again. We've got a few of the artists uh, speaking and there's bits of um, content and audio clips and things. So we'd be delighted if you join us again. 
but yeah, use your same link to get in. It's a webinar format again. And um, do, you know, if you've got thoughts afterwards, do keep using the We Are Commoners hashtag and, you know, just the, the exhibition is touring until the middle of next year. So you've got a long time to process thoughts from this symposium and just, you know, keep putting your thoughts on there. We'd love to capture them. But thank you, everyone. And thanks to everyone for coming along. Wonderful. Let's go and have a cup of tea. Yeah. Bye. Bye. Okay. Bye, everyone.